I invite you to turn with me uh, to the book of Luke as uh, we pick up our series uh, in the book of Luke again. Uh, And this morning we're going to be reading and focusing on Luke chapter 6, verses 37 through 45. Luke 6, beginning with verse 37, I hear the word of the Lord as it comes to us this morning. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. He also told them this parable. Can a blind man lead a blind man? Will they not both fall into a pit? A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to this plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you yourself fail to see the plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For out of the overflow of his heart, his mouth speaks. Uh, There ends the reading of God's word, and may he add his blessing to it as we consider it this morning. Uh, Brothers and sisters, uh, friends, I want you to imagine uh, for a moment that uh, you and I are walking through an orchard. Uh, You may pick the orchard of your choice, uh, be it apple or peach, uh, whatever uh, fruit uh, may be your preference. And as you move uh, through the rows of these well-cultivated trees... Uh, You see these trees laden down with uh, flowers if it's spring or laden down with ripening fruit as the summer progresses. But as you uh, make your way down the rows, you come to a tree that looks in every way like the rest of the trees, but the difference is that it doesn't have any flowers and it doesn't have any fruit. You see, one of the things uh, that is common to uh, the cultivation of fruit trees is the idea of grafting, where you take a a vigorous rootstock, usually from a wild, uncultivated type of a tree, and you graft onto it the standard or the trunk of a hybrid tree that perhaps is not as, uh, as vigorous or as hardy, but has been selected because it produces desirable fruit. And that top is is grafted onto that base as they grow together. You now have a vigorous tree that bears good fruit. Uh, But I have seen a number of times, and perhaps you have seen as well, uh, where the uh, top eventually dies out and there is new growth that comes up from the roots. And it is wild growth. It is vigorous growth. We see this with flowering trees too, right? Uh, uh, Or uh, weeping trees, a a weeping cherry take, for example, (laughs) and shooting up out of the middle of it, you have this upright, vigorously upright tree. In many ways, there's a resemblance between the two. But that wild tree does not belong in the orchard. That wild tree stands out from the rest of the trees for its lack of fruit, for its lack of usefulness. And this is an image, I think, that will be helpful to us as we consider the passage in front of us this morning. For uh, as we continue our consideration, particularly of Luke chapter 6, 
uh, and this uh, kingdom foundations message that Jesus has been delivering, uh, we come to a, a section that I believe is best understood as uh, Jesus giving to us the marks of a disciple. What are, the, what are the characteristics of a disciple of Christ? What are the characteristics of a man, a woman, a boy, or a girl who has been brought into the kingdom of God and is partaking of the kingdom blessings? And that's what we're going to be looking at in verses 37 through 45. Uh, what, what, what are the marks of a disciple? Well, Christ teaches in these verses that disciples of Christ are recognized by their graciousness, their teachability, and their humility. Their graciousness, their teachability, and their humility. Uh, consider, first of all, the fact that disciples are gracious. And we see this in verses 37 through 38. Well-known verses. Uh, it's funny, in a, in a very uh, biblically illiterate time, it is quite likely that these are still the most commonly known verses of the Bible. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Maybe not that last part. Okay? But the point that Jesus is making in verses 37 through 38 is that disciples of Christ are marked by a gracious disposition. Uh, what, what Jesus teaches, first of all, in, in these verses is that there's a connection between what we give and what we get. Gracious people, those who extend grace to others, receive grace. Whereas those who are critical and stingy may expect the same kind of treatment in return. Now, this is true on a horizontal level, is it not? Uh, that's not to imply that we always get what we give, uh, but, but very often there is this correlation, right? We have all known gracious people, and what is true of gracious people? Well, others long to be around them, first of all. What a blessing it is to be in the presence of a gracious person. Uh, of a person who is a, an upbuilder rather than one who tears down. Someone who rather than when they mention somebody else in the conversation, rather than focusing on uh, this or that negative characteristic or gossiping about the troubles that are in their lives, instead, instead uh, wants to, to bring out and to highlight the good in that person's character. People flock to that kind of a person. But it's, it's also true, right, that, when that, per, uh, when that person who is gracious makes a mistake or when, when others standing back give a general assessment of that person's life, they're inclined to be gracious to that person. But the remarkable thing and the terrifying thing is that what we're talking about here is not simply a horizontal fact of life. This isn't simply a truism of the world. But Jesus is saying, you may expect this in your vertical relationship with God as well. If you're a gracious person, God will be gracious to you. If you are a critical and stingy person who marks every fault and failure in those around you, God will be stingy and critical of you. Well, this draws on and really brings out into the light, I think, our tendency. We all have a craving for justice, but we have a truncated view of justice. We have uh, what I, I am calling a punitive idea of justice. What does that mean? It's that kind of, that, that idea of justice where we look at somebody else with that, with that set in our face with the gritted teeth and say, I hope you get what you deserve. I hope you get what's coming to you. It's a punitive, it's a punishing idea of justice. Uh, and, and one illustration of this fact, by the way, 
is the way in which we listen to sermons. And I'm going to suggest that there's going to be a peculiar temptation in this morning's sermon to listen to this sermon for somebody else. Boy, I hope so-and-so is listening this morning as we look out the side, uh, you know, our peripheral. Are they paying attention? Are you getting the message? We're guilty, right? We laugh because it strikes us to the heart. Perhaps every single one of us in this room is guilty of listening to sermons for other people. And that's, that's really an outflow of this punitive idea of justice. This, uh, maybe we could call it better, a self-righteous idea of justice. That I'm doing all right, but, but Jim and Jane, they really need the Lord's work in their lives. And he's got to work on his hands. You see, our maxim in life tends to be this. Do unto others as they do unto you. Almost word-for-word word lexical similarity with Jesus' maxim, but the complete inverse of what Jesus teaches. We tend to think, do to others as they do unto you. Although we want to double down, right? You slap me once, I slap you twice. I'm going to get my vengeance. I am going to exact every last drop of blood out of this grievance that I have with you. And what a contrast this forms to the Father's uh, grandiose and gracious justice. Because uh, if our punitive idea of justice is, I hope you get what you have coming to you, perhaps we could best express our Heavenly Father's idea of justice this way. I foot the bill to give you what you don't deserve. I give you myself. I give you my son, my beloved son, my son in whom I am well pleased. God's riches at Christ's expense. You see, that's the lavish graciousness that our Father displays uh, toward us. Uh, Paul says it this way in Romans 5, verse 8. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. When we got it together and we were righteous, Christ died for us. No, that's not what it says, is it? God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's the graciousness of our Heavenly Father. And thus it is that Jesus' maxim, as found in chapter 6, verse 31, if you take a look, backing up in the passage, do to others as you would have them do to you. Don't give punishing justice. I'm going to give you as many lashes plus one more as you gave me. But give the justice, or give, uh, perceive of justice in this way, give what you want to get. We could call it proactive justice rather than reactive justice. I am going to go out of my way to give unto you what it is that I desire to have. And Christ is saying in verses 37 and 38 that when we live in this gracious way, we may expect the same kind of gracious return. We may expect that on a horizontal level, but we may expect that particularly as I take his focus to be from our Father in heaven. That as we do good to others, as we overlook the faults, the foibles, the failings of other people, so too God will be gracious as he assesses our faults, foibles, and failings. Now that we want to insert a caveat here, uh, because the reason that the world seizes onto these verses, that the way in which the world uses these uh, verses is as a weapon against the church, right? Uh, and, and so uh, we live in the time where actually passing judgment on anyone or anything is perhaps the greatest possible sin that you could commit. Uh, how often have, has somebody said to us, or 
Maybe we've even said to somebody else, don't judge me. Don't judge me. That's, that's like the way, the, the way in which uh, uh, almost everybody seems to preface any type of self-disclosure anymore. Uh, don't judge me, but. Right? And, and yet, uh, Christ is not saying that we are to live a discernment-free life in this world. Uh, Christ does not, uh, does not support any kind of an idea that judgment is not actually necessary in the Christian life. As a matter of fact, it is. Uh, consider, uh, for example, just a few lines of scriptural evidence. Uh, first of all, John calls us to test the spirits whether they are from God. John, uh, 1 John 4, verse 1. Christ himself, in Matthew, verses 7, uh, Matthew 7, verses 15 and 16, says, Watch out for false prophets. And goes on to say, By their fruit you will recognize them. Uh, you see, there, we are called to make judgments, right? If, if we walk into this no-judgment zone, there's nothing to protect us from being led astray by false teachers. We are to be discerning. We are to pass judgments. This is good. This is bad. Uh, Paul passes judgment on an unrepentant sinner in the Corinthian church, and he rebukes the church for not exercising godly judgment themselves in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. So what, what Jesus is saying here is not never judge under any circumstances. But Jesus is warning against a particular type of judgment. Now I wonder, have you ever run into a grammar Nazi? I suspect most of us have one or two in our lives. And, and you can hardly speak a sentence without being corrected. Uh, the, we, we call those, in the Midwest anyway, grammar Nazis, right? They're, they're watching over you like a dictator to correct every uh, minor fault that you have in your expression of the English language. Well, well, what Jesus is warning against here is being a spiritual Nazi. that we're inspecting continually the lives of those around us. Expecting failures and faults, waiting to pounce on their failures and faults, magnifying their failures and faults. It is this hypercritical way of living which Jesus is warning us against here. Uh, and and uh, much to that effect, Peter says in 1 Peter 4, verse 8, above all, love, cover, or, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. That's the positive expression of what Jesus is saying here. Whatever we call love is not love if it insists in, draw, uh, in picking out every failure of our neighbor. There are times when sin has to be addressed on a, a, a relational level. There are times when sin needs to be addressed on a church level in, uh, through the process of, of church discipline. That is biblical. Both of those are biblical. But we are not to be nitpicking like those spies, right? <laughs> the, the neighborhood spies that are peeking out of the curtains. We're peeking out of the blinds. We're snooping into our neighbor's business, always trying to uh, turn over what baggage they have, what kind of dirty laundry they have, what kind of skeletons there are in their closet. And so often the skeletons are so tiny, right? They're so silly. And, and sometimes they're just simply our own personal preference. And Jesus says, don't. Disciples do not conduct themselves in that way. Disciples are, are gracious. And this is manifest especially in forgiveness. You see, he warns uh, uh, against grace hoarders. Those who think they, they've received grace, but they can't give grace. He warns against that. But he calls us to forgiveness. Forgiveness is the positive application of the preceding exhortation. You see, our reaction to offenses committed against us reveals whether we have a punitive disposition or whether we have a gracious disposition. And, and Jesus is calling us to a different standard as we evaluate the offenses of others 
against us. How do we tend to evaluate them? Well, we tend to evaluate them asking this question. What does she deserve? What does she deserve for this unforgivable transgression that she's committed against me? But Jesus says, no, you ought to place yourself in her position and say, how would I want to be treated? What would I want to receive in her place? You see, we want justice for offenders, but mercy for ourselves. That's what Jesus is exposing. We want justice for everybody else. God, I hope you get them. But God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's not justice. Not according to God's standard. Notice this also. Look again at verse 37. Forgive and you will be forgiven. There are no limitations or conditions that are placed on this call to forgive. There's no ifs. If she does A, B, or C. If he asks my forgiveness, then... There are no ifs in Jesus' call to forgive. There is no unless. Forgive a man, forgive a woman unless they do this. Because these sins are unforgivable on a horizontal level. There's none of that. And there's no when. And I want to call out what I believe is an incredibly bad interpretation of Scripture that prevails in our modern times, which says this, that I cannot forgive unless you ask for my forgiveness. I am here to tell you that it is not what the Bible teaches. That is not what Jesus teaches, and it could not be more clear from our text. Now, it is true that reconciliation in a relationship cannot take place until the offending party comes and asks the forgiveness of that person that has been offended against. That's true. But forgiveness is a position of the heart. Forgiveness is a deeply personal decision. I will not continue to review this offense in my mind. I will not continue to talk with other people about this offense. I will not use this offense against the person who has offended me. That's forgiveness. And Christ calls us to this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Do you see the measure of his love and his grace? That's the measure of love and grace to which he calls us. That is what he calls us to imitate. When Peter asks him, uh, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he offends against me? Seven times? And Jesus says 77 times. Matthew 18, verse 22. Uh, the point not being that there is a statute of limitations. And, and you may be saying here this morning, well, so-and-so has offended me 78 times. And now I'm going to sock it to him. The point being made is, is unlimited forgiveness. It's a high standard. It's an incredibly high standard. But Jesus uh, emphasizes this in Matthew 6, verse 14 through 15, where he elaborates on, uh, this command is elaborated on a bit further. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But now listen to these terrifying words. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. I don't think we take that as seriously as we ought to. 
because we walk around and we harbor unforgiveness toward one another in, in an unconscionable way. And we are ready sometimes to take that thing to the grave. This is a trespass that can never be forgiven. This relationship will never be reconciled. That's just unbelief. And it's a rejection of Christ's call on your life and mine. You see, unforgiveness betrays at least two things about us. Number one, it betrays a kind of pride. A pride that says, I am more fit to judge and, and, and my neighbor is more fit to be condemned because of their offense against me than I am fit to be condemned for my offenses, my immeasurable offenses against God. What a horrible thing to say. None of us would actually like say that with our mouths, but we say that with our lives. I can hold on to this even though God has released me. What a horrible thing to say. What a horrible thing to think. It betrays, secondly, a lack of trust in God. A lack of trust in God's justice. A lack of trust in God dealing with everyone's offenses. What we're saying when we insist on being judge uh, and jury in our neighbor's situation, lock them away forever, give them the death sentence... We're saying, I don't trust God to do justly with him or her. I'm going to punish them. What a horrible, horrible way to live. Well, now there is this uh, focus on the reward of generosity. You see, this is a call to gracious living. And, and now we have this positive focus, uh, verse uh, 38 Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. The question then is not, what is my obligation to her? The question is not, what does he deserve? But the question is, how can I reflect my father's generosity toward him and toward her? That's the question. Now, there's an objection, perhaps, floating around in our minds. This is a, an objection that we deal with when we come to passages like this in Scripture, which is that this is contrary to the gospel, isn't it? Don't we feel that way sometimes, right? We're saying, this is a precondition, then. Uh, I, I, guess, I guess what you're saying, Pastor, is that, that Christ's grace really isn't as free as you said it was last Sunday. Well, what Jesus is saying here is that there is a correlation between the way in which we deal with others and what it is that we receive. But as uh, many in the scientific and medical field will tell you, correlation does not equal causation. Your graciousness, your forgiveness, your generosity do not cause or earn or obtain salvation. They do not obtain God's generosity toward you. They do not obtain God's forgiveness for you. But there is a correlation between the two such that they cannot be separated. And the, 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 that will become just a bit more clear how that works as we progress. But note this, that no one can outgive God. That's the point in verse 38. No one can outgive God himself. Because though our giving may cost us dearly, though it may cost us dearly to forgive a transgression of another against us, though we may want to hold on to that thing and you're pry we're, we're prying our hands off that grievance, it is nothing compared to the costly love of our God in Christ. It's a drop in the bucket. And the reward that awaits those who are disciples of Christ, who are justified through faith in Christ, is so inconceivably great. Not a grain will be missing. Uh, what we give will undoubtedly be enhanced when we receive it back from God our Father. 
because uh, here he has this image of the marketplace and, and it, it's a container of grain or, or rather uh, pouring grain into the, the garment of, of the person receiving the grain and shaking it down, making sure that the kernels of grain come as close to each other as you can and continuing to heap and heap and heap on top. Not a scanty uh, half cup, not a scanty lap full, but an over. Uh, flowing, abounding, giving is what we experience from our God. You see, disciples of Christ are to be marked by the same gracious disposition that the Father displays. But second, the second march of, uh, or mark of the disciple is that disciples are teachable. They are teachable. We see this in verses 39 through 40. First of all, there's this proverb or, or this uh, picture, this illustration, a parable, I guess, is what Luke calls it, uh, about the danger of spiritual blindness. It can be kind of hard to make the transition from 38 into 39, uh, but I believe that they're very closely connected. The first point that Jesus is making is that we are all traveling somewhere. Do you know that? That today, whatever else is going on in your life, wherever you are living, whatever you are pursuing in this world, you are traveling somewhere. You are headed to a destination very often, haphazardly, unthinkingly. Uh, we don't really necessarily pick the destination that we're going to. We are just headed. You were born onto uh, the, the road, so to speak. And you're walking. You're walking somewhere, and the road that you're walking is leading to something. The question is, do you know where you're going? Are your eyes open? Uh, you see, not all paths have equal merit. That's the second point that Jesus is making with this parable. Not all paths have equal merit. Your path may end in disaster. Uh, if you are a blind person, a spiritually blind person, following somebody who can't see where they're going, you are going to end up in disaster. You're going to fall in the ditch, and that's just the beginning of your problems. You see, the point that Jesus is making is too often we fail to evaluate what the trajectory of our lives reveals about what or who we're following. Now let's back up and apply that in, in light of verses 37 and 38. If we are living in an ungracious way, a stingy way, it reveals a kind of blindness in our lives. If we are living in the sin of unforgiveness of this, that, or the other offense, or maybe a whole stinking pile of them, it betrays a kind of spiritual blindness that is present in our lives. What we can't see is that we are blind followers of a blind guide. This becomes clearer now, jumping forward to verse 40. A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. You see, he warns against the danger of spiritual blindness, and then he calls us, really, to be conformed to himself. Jesus calls us to be conformed to himself. Uh, he lays out this truism, okay? That everyone who is fully trained, every student who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Now, we don't always see that so clearly uh, as uh, we might have in, in an earlier time when there were far less institutions, there were far less teachers, or far fewer teachers. But it is uh, a real reality that our teachers profoundly shape and influence us, either for good or for ill. And if you did a study of philosophy, for example, you would see that philosophy uh, is really not a, a history of originals, but it's a history of building on the thought of those who have gone before you. A teacher shapes his or her student in profound ways. That is true if we follow Christ. We will be conformed to Christ. We will be made like Christ. We, our character, our disposition will begin to resemble his. And it will be true if we do not follow Christ. 
if we follow Christ, consider for a moment what we will be. Gracious. Right? Jesus himself, the epitome of graciousness. Generous to those who just simply don't deserve it. Going out of those to help, uh, going out of his way to help anybody that he sees has a need. Calling, inviting, drawing people unto himself, unto salvation in him. Giving the very greatest gift of all, his own life. What is Jesus if he is not gracious? I believe that's the point that he's making. You can learn a lot about who you're following or what you're following if you look at the trajectory of your life. If you are living in bitterness and unforgiveness today, you are not following Jesus. That is an uncomfortable fact, but it is a fact based on this passage. You may be in a path of backsliding or perhaps you've never experienced the grace of Christ as it truly is. But you are not following Jesus if you are walking in the path of unforgiveness. You have not learned very much from Jesus if you continue to be hypercritical of those around you, picking out their faults and focusing on those. There's a lot of growth required here. Because every student that is perfectly taught, completely taught, will be like his teacher. So who is your teacher? This is a call to self-examination. So then disciples are gracious, they are teachable, namely taught by Christ, conformed uh, to Christ, marked by this growing conformity to Christ. But finally, disciples are also humble. And we see this in verses 41 through 42. Again, very well-known verses, right? A very well-known and uh, humorous illustration that Christ gives here. And what he's calling out, first of all, is the folly of spiritual farsightedness. Now, probably some of you in the audience today are farsighted. Uh, It's a fascinating uh, disease, if you will, where that which is close appears blurry and you have a hard time uh, focusing on, but you can see so clearly that which is uh, far away. Well, that's actually our spiritual condition by nature. We're all spiritually farsighted. We have a distinct problem with observing the problems of our own life. Oh, but we can see with eagle eye clarity the faults of other people. Oh, how clearly. It is a trial to be such an arrived and well-formed person in a world of such broken people. Spiritual farsightedness. And he gives a picture that that illustrates the foolishness of this, the absurdity of this, right? Because here is a man who has a speck of sawdust that has flown into his eye. And his neighbor comes walking down the road with a beam, uh, like the beam that would be used uh, for the roof of the house, a beam standing out of his own uh, eye saying, let me help you with that, brother. I'm afraid you're not seeing so clearly these days. but you can't get close enough because that big old beam sticking out of your eye, right? You beat somebody else down with the beam that's sticking out of your own eye. As you, you, you know, it's, it's, it's the classic T-Rex arms problem, right? <laughs> I, I, I want to help. <laughs> the beam is sticking out of my eye and my arms aren't long enough to reach you. But it's deadly serious too, right? Jesus says, why are you like that? He calls us then to accurate self-evaluation. As would-be sin scouts, he reminds us that charity begins at home. That sin scouting starts with me. And it is applied to me. 
that I need to see who I really am, that I need to repent of my sin before God, that I need to pray uh, for his sanctifying grace and seek to put off that sin before I would perform a delicate surgery on my neighbor's eye. But again, he doesn't say that this doesn't have a place. This place, this mutual exhortation, this encouraging and exhorting one another in brotherly love, no, that definitely has a place. But it must be preceded by humility. Humility, again, being this, uh, a clear evaluation of myself in light of who God is. That's really what humility is. Because when, when I begin to see who I am, when I begin to see who God is, it cuts me down to size. God grows immense. I grow so unspeakably tiny. Right? And when that happens, now I am prepared to come alongside of you and to help you. But so often we're not humble. We don't really perceive who we, who we are. Uh, we don't really see our faults for what they are. Jesus calls us to evaluate ourselves. This is uh, what Paul had sa uh, says in Galatians 6 verse 1. Brothers, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. But watch yourself, or you may also may be tempted. There's nothing so aggravating as, as a brother or sister who's actually walking in pretty obvious sin, coming to you and criticizing you for a foible. Perhaps you've experienced that. It's hard to be humble on the receiving end of that at, at, at a point in time like that. And Jesus seeks to correct this problem. He reminds us that disciples are humble. Disciples are gracious. They are teachable, being conformed uh, and growing in conformity to Christ. And disciples are humble. And then he gives a closing illustration in verses 43 through 45. And here we begin now to understand the correlation between the way in which we deal with other people and what it is that we receive from God. It is not that we obtain grace or favor with God by our gracious disposition towards others, but rather that our gracious disposition and generosity with others is a fruit that grows out of being rooted in Christ. No good tree bears bad fruit. Nobody who is rooted in Christ by faith can continue for long in an ungracious, harshly judgmental attitude. No one who is truly rooted in Christ can justify the presence of unforgiveness in his or her life. Why? Because no good tree bears bad fruit. There is, however, a tree that bears bad fruit, and it's a bad tree. As you walk through the orchard, as you observe this tree now with misshapen and unappealing uh, fruits growing on it, Though it may have the general shape and, and size of the rest of the trees, though there may be an initial resemblance between the trees in a row, you may rightly conclude that something is desperately wrong with that tree. Because it's not bearing the fruits in keeping with what you would expect. That condemning harshly judging, unforgiving attitude. That's the fruit of the flesh. Do you know that? Do you believe that? That's what the Bible teaches. This is the very thing that we've been delivered from, brothers and sisters. It is this kind of attitude, this kind of disposition 
for which Christ came in the world to offer himself. How can you stand at the foot of the cross and say, I will not forgive my brother or sister unless I will forgive my brother or sister if, when? How can you look at the Son of God hung there, put to an open shame for your sake, and live ungraciously? Whether to people within the church or outside of the church. Such a thing is incomprehensible. Do you understand? That's the logic of what Jesus is saying here. You get what you give. There's a correlation between the two. And it is because if you are rooted in Christ, you will bear good fruit. Not just a, a little a box of fruit. You know, I, I have peas in my garden and, and they're barely enough to qualify as a snack this year. But you will be a tree laden down, branches breaking under the weight if you are in Christ. Because his will is that you would remain in him, that you would abide in him. And he promises that every branch that remains in him will bear much fruit. Gracious fruits. Forgiving fruits. Christ-like fruits. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, we praise you for your generosity and your kindness toward us. We don't deserve it. We are so unthankful many times and we demonstrate this unthankfulness by our exacting and, and harsh judgment of others. Father, forgive us. Forgive us for being unforgiving. Forgive us for being harsh and ungracious with others when you have been so gracious to us. Lord, work in us by your spirit repentance that we may turn away from the fruit of the, bearing the fruit of the flesh from the root of the flesh, that we rooted in Christ may bear forth much fruit unto thy name's honor and glory. That when people encounter us, whether they like us or hate us, they must conclude that we resemble Christ. Lord, move among us. Apply your word then as you see fit. For we ask it in your name and for the sake of your glory. Amen.